Good evening. Good evening. Hello. Welcome to another presentation from the Foundation Law Committee. Tonight's topic is Consumer Debt and Bankruptcy Know Your Rights. And we are privileged tonight to have with us a member of the Brooklyn Bar and a frequent lecturer for the Brooklyn Bar as well as, well as other CLE and non-CLE programs. Which class? Which class is the quintessential Court Street lawyer as defined by the New York Times. But for us at the Brooklyn Bar, we all know Rich as someone who is very, very approachable, always willing to share his advice. Anytime I've asked Rich to lecture, he has done so willingly and, um, and very, very well. Um, he wants to um, present and share his knowledge with a wide range of audiences tonight. We have with us, um, I see some on um, attorneys and judges, and as well as the public. So all of the Foundation Law Committee programs are here to the public, but the judiciary and the bar are always welcome to attend. So thank you everybody for coming, and for um, those watching online, this is, um, I understand, Facebook Live, and we have the Book and Daily people here as well. So um, thank you um, to Rich, and I hope you enjoy a very, um, very rich presentation. Um, just talk loud. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm I'm Richard Class, and um, I I'm gonna sit here, but uh, and just go stand the podium. But we're gonna talk for I say about an hour and a half. But you're gonna be helping me. Um, we're a small group, so all of you are gonna have to help me by peppering me with questions. Um, every friend and I have been doing this uh, program uh, every year for I think it's seven or eight years now, maybe. Uh, and uh, we find that it's best when people ask us questions, it opens up topics and, and it's really uh, it, it makes it more flowing and, and uh, gets the conversation lively. So I'm going to talk about consumer debt, uh, credit card debt, things of that sort, and also bankruptcy. So uh, I'm going I'm to start. And, and you can interrupt me with questions whenever you want about the, the topic I'm on. Uh, feel free to ask anything. I'm going to first start off. I, so I'm practicing law 26 years now. I have a general civil litigation practice here on Court Street. And a lot of my practice deals with uh, debtor and creditor issues. Uh, consumer debt, credit card cases, foreclosure, bankruptcy, uh, uh, bank. Uh, dealing with uh, um, real estate litigation involving debt, uh, fraudulent conveyance litigation. So uh, I, I cover a lot, a lot of the different areas that surround uh, debtor and creditor law. So uh, for our discussion, uh, a lot of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about you or the person, I'm talking usually about the debtor. Okay, the, the creditors, they'll have their attorneys who do the sue, and I'm here to talk to consumers. Okay, and, but I don't mind talking, putting on the other hat and talking about creditor as well. Um, so consumer, consumer debt, uh, we tend to think of it as a broad, broad uh, uh, types of debt first before we, we narrow it down. But it tends to be uh, what we'll call unsecured debt and secured debt. And uh, what that basically means is, is when a debt is secured, that's where the, the debtor has offered up collateral. So you all know that a, a mortgage is collateral that you're giving to the bank to give you a loan on your house. Uh, if you want a loan on the phone, the creditor can say, okay, give me a lien, uh, a UCC lien against the phone, and I'll give you a dollar, whatever it is, and, and then when you pay me back, I'll remove the lien. So uh, that's what makes a creditor secure is that they have uh, collateral they're holding in the event that you default. And um, sometimes there are, there are issues in litigation as to whether or not that credit is truly secured or secured to what extent. Well, we, we can, I can be happy to discuss that, that issue, but generally speaking, that's what uh, secured credit is. Unsecured uh, are what we call general debts. Uh, and for the most part, people uh, are coming to me, consumers have credit card debts. Um, so when somebody applies for a credit card, uh, whether online, phone, mail, um, they receive a uh, approval for a certain amount of credit. They sign the uh, agreement, or, or nowadays it's uh, e-sign, and they acknowledge uh, receiving the agreement. And 
the creditor, the credit card company, uh, extends a loan through, uh, it's an open-end loan, but it's a loan through uh, using the Visa card, MasterCard, whatever it is. And, it, and really, at this point, it's kind of like VCRs in the 1970s, where you had two companies making all of them credit cards. There are only a handful of companies. They just rebrand everything so that uh, uh, it sounds like there are a lot out there, but there are a very few handful of banks doing credit cards, and they just uh, promote them uh, through different uh, um, methods. And so you see a lot of different names, but they tend to whittle down to a few credit card companies. And uh, those credit card companies are, they're deciding whether or not somebody's credit worthy, for the most part, using uh, artificial intelligence. And then they have somebody kind of guiding it. So we really, we, that's why so many people are very uh, aware, alert, scared about their credit score. Um, and if I'm going too fast and, and you want to ask me questions, I'll be happy to do it. Uh, credit score has become very important. It's kind of like getting a, a good grade in school. Um, the, the, the one that people know the most is called FICO. The Fair Isaacs uh, uh, has a credit score. They're competing credit, credit scores. But basically, uh, a, a credit score tells the uh, credit lender whoever's going to be extending credit. Uh, whether or not the, the debtor, the consumer, is credit worthy, and to what extent. So what the credit score controls, and it goes up to, I think, 850, um, uh, it starts, I think, 300. Basically, it's telling uh, um, the lender, okay, if somebody has great credit, which I think is basically 700 and up, um, yeah, give them, first of all, maybe it's lower interest rate, give them a higher credit line, uh, approve the application. Uh, if it's a lower uh, a credit score, it might get denied. If you get denied credit, you're supposed to receive a letter telling you why you're denied credit. And that's a whole course in itself as to how credit scores are developed. But basically, it's a, a done on an algorithm and it, it figures out uh, how much available credit there is, how much is owed, it's going to figure in income. Uh, new this year, um, for many years, people were very, very concerned about getting if there are judgments against them, that the judgment is on the credit report. Um, there's been a lot. The, all three credit report agencies had a lot of litigation involving uh, erroneous reporting of judgments. Because you might have, I don't know, Jose Garcia, and it mixes up the Jose Garcia is a very common name, and credit reports are filled with incorrect data and people are getting denied the things that are not their fault and have nothing to do with them. And so what what the uh, credit scoring companies decided to do, sorry, the credit reporting companies decided to do is to figure out if they remove the judgment lien data from the credit report, how would it affect credit score? And apparently not much. So they basically decided to sidestep all the litigation. So from now on, we're not going to report judgments in the credit report. So we'll see how that all plays out. Um, it doesn't mean that judgments are ineffectual. It just means that for the purposes, for a lot of people felt that getting a judgment against them is on adverse on their credit report, the dark mark is not going to be there anymore. So the effect is a little bit different. Um, what, they, what they found is that whether it was a judgment or not, People who are in trouble tended to be in trouble anyway. And I, I will tell you that most of the time, now let me give a plug. Uh, Roseanne is here. She's the head of our Brooklyn Bar's uh, legal referral service, Roseanne Hebert. Um, she thank you, thank you, thank you. a great job. Her office does a great job. They send people, consumers who need help to lawyers like me, other lawyers, people that she sends to me many times. They're coming to me for one debt. They have five or six others. It's usually the latter part of our conversation tonight, bankruptcy, it tends to be with the smoke is higher. Um, so I, I find it very rare that somebody comes to me because uh, that person has one particular credit card debt. Usually they, they, they've stuffed everything into the shopping bag and they don't want to deal with it. They throw it away. People are still getting mail, um, it, which basically it's all delinquent letters and junk mail. But um, that's 
that's basically uh, uh, what you'll find is that people have one problem with a credit card. They'll have problems with a lot of other types of debt. Other types of debt you might see, which we don't we can go into, but we don't have to tonight. Uh, auto deficiencies are a big one. Um, when and I, unfortunately, a lot of times, uh, a family member or a friend, girlfriend, co-signed a loan for a boyfriend, spouse. I say boyfriend because almost every time they come in, it's either a close family friend or the boyfriend that got the car. The full bill on the payments, they repo the car, and now they, if they sell off the car, there's a deficiency of uh, eight, ten thousand dollars. They're suing the person who signed the agreement, and they're going to sue so the the boyfriend and the co-signer girlfriend, and um, so that's another unsecured debt that will come about. And, yep, go ahead. Um, I don't know if you see the identity theft. So identity theft. President, why there a few questions for this or not? Uh, you might now. You might want to repeat it just so okay. that we can catch it. Um, so, so uh, identity theft. How, how does it figure in? So, um, a lot of times people have problems with identity theft, and it's it's a little bit not that it's easy to clear. You you all watch the LifeLock commercial. You know it's really hard to clear, but. <laughs> Police report, and the police really don't want to take a report. Fraud affidavit um, to the creditor. You say, I'm a victim of fraud. They'll send you a fraud affidavit of forgery or fraud, whatever it is. Um, depending on how much, the, how, how many different cards the fraudster took out in the person's name, sometimes it's easier, and it's said, it's easier to just lump it all into a bankruptcy filing because the person. They may have had some fraud, but they tended to also have some legitimate debt that get rid of everything in a bankruptcy and lump it all together. It doesn't mean that you can't dispute the debt, but one bankruptcy filing might get rid of it. And we'll talk about that. But as a figure in here, if if there's a forgery and a fraud, it's an absolute defense to the action. So it, it means that a person doesn't owe it. They're going to have to prove that is the, per the, the consumer's account. Does that answer your question? Okay. Another uh, one you'll see, student loans. There's a lot going on now with student loans, and it's very up in the air. Until uh, changes in the bankruptcy code about 15 years ago, it was possible to discharge old student loans if they were owed for more than eight years after uh, they came, matured, there was and went to repayment, it was possible to discharge old student loans, of course, uh, and I can't just blame uh, a, a, one side of Congress. Both both sides kind of the, the banking industry did a good job, um, and they got together. They amended the bankruptcy code and, and to make most student loans non-dischargeable. So most people who file bankruptcy, they already know that for the most part they can't get rid of tax uh, tax that they owe and student loan debt that they owe. But that's another kind of consumer debt that a lot of people come with. And then come, aside from credit cards, will be um, either business loans, personal guarantees, um, credit credit lines, uh, unsecured credit lines that were taken out, not a home equity line of credit, um, which that those are also, uh, it, it's also possible to have after the home is sold in foreclosure and there's still money left over due and owing to the bank, some banks, some lenders will pursue a deficiency judgment, which means if the house sold for, I'll make it up, $200,000, the bank was owed three hundred. dollars the bank can go to the judge and ask the judge for a deficiency judgment for the extra $100,000. It's not very common, so but it does happen. Um, so you, you will see things like that. There are any other types of debts that people have and questions about? Okay. So once, if everybody's paying the credit card and you're chugging along, everything's fine. And and those of you may have noticed that it's, a, I guess, it's about a year or two years now that even credit card, the statements you get, um, which were changed by, by law to make them more understandable to whatever extent that is, 
Um, they keep trying to simplify things and then they make them more complicated. Mm -hmm. If anybody's bought a house, you know that what I'm talking about. Um, it says there was something called a HUD statement, but they, they don't use them anymore. They, they use something else. Um, but that's a different story. Um, when once someone defaults on a credit card, um, it gets it, it depends on where it's at. Okay? And all of these uh, credit card companies they have obviously typically system, but any business would a certain number of days from when the payment is due, when it's sending out the next day demand, and then it ratchets up. So it really depends at what stage the default occurs and how much it is. Sometimes the advice may be, look, the person needs to get some more time and they're calling incessantly, send in a very small payment, see if they take it, it buys a little bit of extra time. That may be great advice for somebody who needs uh, a little time to, to waiting for the tax refund to come in and then spread it around. Um, they're able to do this, do that. Um, once the debt is owed, uh, and realize that also the, the, on top of the, the uh, industry is the government telling the industry you have to charge off debt within a certain period of time. That's why if you ever see a credit card, uh, uh, a credit report that says charge off, some people are under the impression, well, that means I don't owe it anymore. No, it just means that the, the bank had to charge off, but it's still due. You can still be sued for the debt, but it's it's an accounting mechanism. It says, okay, we're, we're moving it out of current into past due. So, okay, so uh, the question was about uh, getting a 1099 for a charge off debt. Um, so there is a concept, it's a tax concept of loan forgiveness. Um, if somebody owes me a thousand dollars and I say, don't pay, I forgive you of the debt, technically I'm supposed to send that person a 1099 because it's income. Now, it's really weird, like we don't think of it as income, but if that person does not have to pay back the $1,000, they made $1,000. So that reporting gets made and then you go to the accountant and say, well, look, I, I have a legitimate dispute about the debt. That's one thing. If the answer is, well, and the credit card company, they have to tell you if they settle with debt for a thousand, I'm gonna get up 4,000 to do, and they sell for 2,000, Unless it's a legitimate dispute, they forgave some of the debt. It's supposed to make a report. So it, it, it's something that would have to be accounted for to the government. It, the 1099 may be legitimate. So it does create uh, like a phantom income. Okay, with, so um, there is an issue there. Um, and But the, then the credit, once the credit is forgiven it, they're not pursuing it. So it's a double-edged sword. Um, and that's why most of the time you won't you won't see that because the creditor wants to go bang for the money. Uh, and they can also, at some point, the creditor can take it off as a bad debt once they've pursued it. The judgment can't collect it, write it off as a bad debt. So uh, uh, there are different accounting reasons why that, that decision may be made. Okay, other questions? Yeah. Once that decision is made and it is at the time of time, it is your income, then it's taxable. Yeah, so. Once it's you see the penny on it, it's taxable income and it's got to be dealt with. So um, it, it is it is a, it causes a lot of havoc for people when they get that, and um, so it, it is a concern. Sometimes um, part of the settlement of of the a debt will be that there was a legitimate dispute regarding the debt and that there's not going to be a report, and you may get some pushback on it, but you fight, okay? Because not every debt is legitimate. Not every amount is legitimate. It may be that the, the debt is, is owed, but not to the extent the credit is pursuing. And there's, that's part of the agreement is how much the, the debt is in dispute and that there won't be a 1099 reporting for the disputed portion. So once, once it's gotten to a certain point, phone calls start. Okay, and, and I'll say that 
for a lot of people, they they start coming to me for bankruptcy advice once the phone calls start because they're incessant. Um, the letters come, but also the phone calls, and people can't take it. Most people want to pay their debts. Most people are not deadbeats in their minds, and they feel genuinely bad. There are a certain number of people that want to go out of this uh, world, owing as many people as possible. That's not the typical consumer, okay? Um, so the, the phone calls start, um, if, and then sometimes they're very tricky. They won't say who's calling. They won't send a follow-up letter, which is supposed to do. So the person doesn't know who's calling. They just got to keep hanging up. Eventually, the consumer will get a letter saying, hi, I'm XYZ Collection Company, whoever I am, and this debt. Um, you can actually then send a letter saying not to call, only write. Um, so get certified mail so you have proof of that um, in case you have to sue later on. Um, we can talk about it, but there's a statute that a lot of debtors use called the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, which regulates how debt collectors are supposed to enforce debts, collect debts, and what they're not allowed to do. Um, so uh, that's a whole topic as well. But basically, um, if, if somebody's in over their head, uh, there's a certain number of no-nos that the credit agency, the credit uh, uh, collection agency is not allowed to do that they have to be concerned about. And that could be reporting to, uh, depending on who the collection agency is, uh, to New York State, New York City, uh, the federal government. There are different report, uh, agencies that enforce debt collection laws. So, uh, and in New York City, there are consumer affairs licenses collection agencies. Um, so the, the letter will have a consumer affairs license number. Unless it's a direct creditor, a, cre a direct creditor bank, you know, Chase Bank is suing so-and-so, the bank is not a debt collector, it's collecting its own debt. But, but primarily, there are circumstances where a creditor can have certain collection laws enforced against it for its practices, but generally we're talking about third parties who are enforcing debts. Um, once the uh, phone calls and letters stop, the next step is going to be uh, a lawsuit. Okay? Um, I, I, wrote over, I wrote a book that came out about five years ago now. And uh, it's on my website. If you, I, I brought over whatever number of copies I have, but you can download the ebook version on the, on my website. Uh, I think I have some extra copies. If anybody wants stuff on my office, uh, which is in 16 Court Street, but the, the information is good. Some of the forms got updated since then. But um, the, then a, law, a lawsuit starts. Primarily, uh, most of you are Brooklyn. Anybody not Brooklyn? Okay, where, which county? Um, Queen, okay, oh, uh, all right, so you hang out. Okay, so the Brook, the courthouse here for Kings County, Brooklyn, is at 141 Livingston Street. Civil Court in Queens is uh, 8917 Sutton Boulevard. And Manhattan is 111 Center Street. So those are the Civil Court. In New York City, we have uh, the Supreme Court in every county of the state. We have a Supreme Court which handles it can handle any kind of case, but it technically handles cases that are above $25,000 because we have a court of what they call limited jurisdiction for cases under $25,000 in the civil court. And Judge Marcon will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the civil court in Brooklyn is the busiest one in the state, I think. But am, I, am I right? I think so. They probably are. I think, okay. I know they handle up. Uh, Tons I don't of think it's busier than the housing court. Oh, yeah, housing court is very busy. Um, but but uh, um, unfortunately, they're getting busier. Who knows? Rent's crazy. But um, the, the civil court in Brooklyn handles a lot of these cases. If somebody, once somebody gets uh, served with a summons, they can either retain a lawyer, and which for most of these cases is not uh, really economical. Because most of the credit card cases are going to be under ten grand, maybe a little bit more. It'll be hard to get a lawyer. Um, it makes some people may be eligible for uh, volunteer lawyers uh, who can help. Uh, but 
um, you can retain a lawyer. You can also answer the lawsuit yourself by going down to the civil court and you file a, an answer pro se, uh, which is on your own. And they'll put the case onto a pro se calendar and somebody will go to the, it's called part 11, uh, which is the pro se part that people are, are representing themselves. And the judge there will conference the case after the answer has been filed. If now, unfortunately, for a lot of people, they kind of they get served with a summons, and it's among the ten others they receive. They hide under the bed, and if a person does not answer the summons, a judgment ensues, a default judgment. You don't show up to court, you default it, uh, and then that default judgment gives a lot of power to the creditor. The creditor can now subpoena banks, uh, garnish wages, attach assets, get liens against things like the house. So a judgment, it, it, well, it, it's a piece of paper, it's a very powerful piece of paper. Um, sometimes people come to me, they, they're, they're on social security, disability, they don't have assets, they have very limited assets. The answer is for those people, that little subset of others, judgment is really not going to interfere with their lives because the, the income is exempt and they have no assets. So like that old expression, you can't throw blood from the stone, um, the judgment doesn't matter. Uh, so um, once, once the person has answered, um, it, it can open up the door to what's called discovery. This F, once the, the pleadings, which are the complaint and the answer have come in, each side is allowed to ask the other side questions, either give me information or give me documents. So the, the consumer, the most important document that the consumer wants to see is send me my credit agreement. Because sometimes people, they actually don't remember signing a credit agreement or they apply for five Discover cards, and they don't know who's suing them for what account, and they say, send me the, my, the application, send me the credit card statements, I want to see it. And it may be that that's not the person's card. I'm actually defending right now a student loan case where ex-wife put husband down uh, uh, as a guarantor on her daughter's uh, student loans, and he's saying that she forged my name, and he's, gonna, he's not defending the case. So it may be that, that the debt is actually not legitimate. Um, if the debt is legitimate, which for the most part we're talking about uh, on credit cards, most people know that they took out that visa card and they owe the $5,000 on it. Um, when they're showing up to court, it tends to be to, to be deal making. Okay, that's the, the, both sides have a lot of reason to make deals, just like any kind of litigation, maybe even more so. Because a lot of people are, are working, unfortunately, hand to mouth, and taking off that day of work and then coming back another day of work hurts. And so they come to court and they can set up a payment schedule. Uh, I, you know, I can I can pay a hundred dollars a month until I pay it off, or I'll borrow two thousand dollars to pay off the five thousand dollar debt. Whatever the deal making is. It can occur at any stage, but it, it, it tends to occur in a court conference if it's possible. Um, and just to tell you, um, depending, depending on how many debts a person has and how much they have available money-wise, um, people can, consumers can make deals to satisfy the, their debts. Um, sometimes people come to me; they owed. Uh, a, I'll make up 25 grand in debts. They took out of their pension $5,000 spread around, and they didn't really, they just paid minimums on a whole bunch of cards, and they didn't really make anything truly go away, and then they filed for bankruptcy anyway. So they kind of squandered the 5000 that they took out of their pension. And if, if all of you can remember one thing from tonight, besides rich request, um, don't take money out of exempt funds, like a pension, life insurance and cash value, annuity, uh, 401k, to pay off non-exempt, uh, to pay off debts, unless it's really 
going to kill it. Because what I see a lot of people do is they owe a lot of debt. They think, okay, let me borrow from my pension plan $10,000 to kind of live on, and I'll pay the minimums, and then I'll catch up. And they come to me. They still owe all the debt they owed with all the, 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 the interest and the continuing. And now the ten grand they had pension money, which they could have protected in bankruptcy, is gone. So they give up their future for their, their, their past, not even their present. So if you remember one thing is don't get in too much over your head by taking out of exempt assets unless you really get rid of all the mess in one shot and there's a way to do it. You, have, you borrow from the parent or the brother to do it or you buy it from the pension to do it, but you're, you're getting rid of all the debt. Sometimes it can be quite effective because you can make a better deal for a reduced lump sum than setting up payments. Any questions so far? Okay. So uh, let's generally with the, with the credit card lawsuits, they either are going to settle or there will be a motion that was called summary judgment. Summary judgment in, in, in any litigation, um, the, the parties have a, a right to a trial uh, by, by either a judge or a jury unless one, well, unless the agreement says you're waiving that right to a jury, but we'll leave that aside for a second. We don't want to get too technical. But if, if one side says, look, Judge, there are no facts in dispute. The law, here's the law, give me a judgment. Credit card lawsuits and mortgage and, and foreclosures, things that involve an agreement, a contract, tend to be very uh, uh, driven towards summary judgment because the facts are not truly at issue. The, the, the fact that the consumer signed the agreement tends not to be a uh, uh, there tends not to be a genuine factual issue about it. Sometimes there's an issue as to whether or not it truly was signed. It's really a binding agreement, as we're now hearing with Stormy Daniels, whether or not there's a binding agreement because he, he didn't sign the agreement, which we will we'll, we'll go to off topic, but that's <coughs> that's the contention. Sorry. <coughs> that's her contention, I think, that in the arbitration, that the agreement that she's not subject to it is because one of the two people, <coughs> Trump's lawyer, but the, the other person did not sign the contract, so it's not binding. I think that's one of the arguments our lawyers make. Um, so you may have that dispute. Or sometimes people, <coughs> their payments have not been properly applied or applied at all. And people keep the records saying, hey, where are the checks? They weren't applied to this account. Which can happen a lot when people have several accounts. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> All right, now, now I mean, somebody has to ask a question, right? Um, so let, now, once the judge has decided that summary judgment should be granted, the, the court's going to grant a judgment in favor of the creditor. Um, in order for the creditor to get a lien against a consumer's house, if the consumer owns a house, they have to docket the judgment. They get a piece of paper from the civil court. That, that says, how am I going? Okay. Oh, what is in done? <laughs> they get a piece of paper from the civil court that, that they didn't take and they, they can, it's called docket. They pay money to have it as a lien against them. Any property the person owns in that county. And there's even, if, if somebody has a judgment from New Jersey, they move to New York, there's even a method of Docketing a judgment in New York from the other state or, or even country. Somebody contact me, they have a judgment against somebody who moved here from England and they want to domesticate it here. And for the, <coughs> the lawyers of the group, you'll remember from law school the word comedy, C O M I T E, not comedy, haha. And that's that's what allows us to enter countries. We say, hey, we like your laws, you like our laws, we'll recognize that you're judging from England because you have laws that uh, guarantee people the right to uh, fairness and, and justice, and so we assume your judgment is valid. We might not do that to North Korea. Um, <laughs> so so once the judgment's entered, um, somebody, a creditor might go to the marshal uh, with uh, an income execution to garnish wages, uh, serve a restraining notice on a debtor's bank account, 
and then the the bank is going to restrain the account. It's, there are certain exemptions for restraining the account, and then a, a, either a city marshal or a sheriff can levy on the account, uh, or do other bad things like to try to get the money. Okay, so um, that's that's a stage of, of a consumer credit case. Okay, and which court is brought in? It, it also depends on where the debt was taken, the credit was taken out, and where the person lives. There, there are laws that govern that. So if somebody lives in Kings County, they won't get sued in Staten Island because that would not comport with our law, which is to bring a case where the debtor is or where the, the contract took place. Um, so there are there are a lot of rules about how collection is done, how how the it's enforced, how it's sued for, how it's reported. Uh, luckily, it's it doesn't seem like it because there are vultures, but it's a regu it's fairly well regulated for what it is. Um, there are issues if anybody's watching them. There's an agency uh, called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that Trump may want to do away with, but it enforces a lot of these laws against very large companies and organizations, and it covers a lot of the uh, debt collection agencies and lenders. Uh, so it really is uh, pretty regulated. It doesn't mean that there aren't mavericks out there that are trying to do things that are disturbing. Uh, there are a lot of complaints about collection, but for the most part, a lot of the complaints seem to be technical violations, not uh, the FDCPA, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, it came about in the 70s. And if you read some of the congressional reports of how and why it got uh, put into law, um, you have people that are really threatened by collection agencies and collectors. A lot of the actual threats uh, are, are they're not that they're not out there, but there are a lot fewer circumstances of what we think of as big bad. Uh, that they tend to be more violations in how the letter is written, how the call was made. Um, it doesn't mean that a debtor who's sitting at home, scared or at the job and worried about calls is not afraid. It's very scary to owe money and to be behind. And you know, but, but for the grace of God go I, who knows who can be a debtor and who knows what can happen. So uh, at least we have some laws that try to keep it a fair uh, playing field for both, both sides. Uh, question, yeah. One of my concerns is if uh, time goes by and it may become too late to dispute something that you want to dispute. For example, you didn't even know there was an account and then they tell you there's a judgment because they sued you and you didn't respond. And um, when that uh, kind of situation happens, I always wonder whether it's too late to go back and say, well, do you have an affidavit that you ever served the lawsuit in the first place? You know, how, how far back can you go once the judgment has been established and it's been sitting there for five years? Okay, so we're talking about how, how long uh, can something go to you kind of deal with it if you didn't know it about it then? Yeah. All right, so first of all, there is a federal law. Everybody gets, when you get your credit card statement, uh, I just got mine. Take a look. Is that the whole, the whole little part that says you have 60 days to dispute any item on your, on your account statement if you think it's wrong? Most people they don't, they don't dispute it, or if they do, they don't have proof of it. And you're, you're hoping that the credit card company has a record of the dispute. Uh, it's really important to look at one's account statement when you get it. Okay, make sure all the charges are legitimate. And if there's one that isn't, file the dispute and try to keep proof of the dispute. Um, that way you have a record in case later on there's a lawsuit, you can prove that you did dispute the item within 60 days. That's, we'll leave that. Next, if there's a lawsuit, a lawsuit is commenced by service of a summons and either a complaint or what's called a summons with notice, but basically a summons means, hey, I'm suing you, come to court. And if the consumer, the defendant, does not answer the summons, the consumer is in default. What happens, it, and, and there was a huge piece of litigation, uh, I guess about 10 or 15 years ago, 
uh, where there was a, a process service agency which did what's called sewer service, which is they, the old days, they said they threw the summons down the, the sewer. Um, 100,000 uh, default judgments were thrown out because the court found so many of the uh, service was done uh, incorrectly, ne never done, never actually served. And actually it spurred uh, one of the developments, you know, technology is wonderful. Um, the process servers now, they have to, it used to be they just had to have a log book. Say I went from, you know, I went from, uh, you know, Peace Highway to here, to here, to serve the summons, and they have a log book. Of, now, they have to have a GPS tracker that actually proves that the process server was at that address. So, it may be that the process server serves somebody at that address, and either it's a, a, a six-family apartment building, they didn't write down apartment four, which is where the consumer lives, but they, they, they didn't write down any, any apartment number, which would be defective, or they serve somebody named Joe, but you, you haven't lived in that apartment for five years. Joe is the person who lives there. If I just tossed it, um, sometimes people will call my office if I'm representing credit and say, hey, you served this paper at my address with the guy, the post, the post was here, but Joe has not lived here for two years. You so say, okay, thank you. Um, or sometimes it, the, the, the paper, it, it was it was taped to the door, but it went away for whatever reason, legitimately went away. And and the consumer does not know that there's a judgment. That the first time that the consumer found out about a judgment is when the bank account was restrained, and they go. The person has to now go to court and file. What's it called? Who knows? Give it. Order to show cause. The person goes down to court and files this paper called an order to show cause, which is, hey, I need a, I need a, a stop sign. Give me a, a what's called like a stay. It's called a stay. A stop sign that says, hey. Don't collect the debt until I come to court and prove that I was not properly served with the summons, and I have a defense to this case. Now, in order to vacate that judgment, you have to show I have an excuse for my default, and I have a meritorious defense. The meritorious defense may be, I don't know anything about this debt. Uh, it, it may be... Uh, I paid this debt. It could be any number of defenses, but you have to put, it's even in the form the court uses, it says my defense is, you have to write down why the judgment is improper. So if that happens, the court will, and, and I'll, I'll say for the most part, uh, a defendant who defaulted, who goes down to court, will, the law is that most people are entitled to have their day in court. That's what the case law says. Every person, every litigant is entitled to his day in court. We don't want to enforce defaults against people who didn't show up. They'll even have, and I'll say that the law is very forgiving. You have people that they don't show up for trial two times, and three times, and they, they then there's a judgment. They defaulted. They show court. They say, hey, I, you know, I couldn't make it that day because I have to go to work. Doctor's appointment. Who now knows? And. They, the judge says, okay, I'll vacate the default, you know, but I'm marking the case final. Okay? At, at least give the person an opportunity. Um, sometimes the judge says, look, you have no defense to this case. I'm sorry you didn't show up, but you really have, you, you owe the debt. There's nothing for us to really talk about, and it's the only Okay? It, it depends uh, uh, on the case, obviously. Um, questions? Okay. So I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i shift, and you can ask me about this as we go. Um, I'm going to shift to bankruptcy a little. Um, we're going to talk about what kinds of bankruptcies there are, and then what goes into the, the pot. Um, generally speaking, there are two broad kinds of bankruptcy. One is called the Chapter 7, which is a liquidation proceeding. The other is called a reorganization which is, uh, we know when, we, when we're watching the business channel, that chapter 11, we hear about the businesses, that they went belly up, they went chapter 11, 
and for individuals, it's called Chapter 13. Um, so there, there's the bankruptcy code. The bankruptcy code that governs bankruptcy is divided into certain chapters of laws. Chapter 7, liquidation, means, generally speaking, Mr. or Ms. Eshelad, I'm going to miss now, trustee, take all of my non-exempt assets, the phone fine, I don't know if there's an exemption for the phone, but take all of my non-exempt assets, convert them to cash, and give that cash to my credit. So the phone is not exempt, sell the phone for a dollar, take the dollar, and spread that dollar among my creditors in a fair way. Okay, that's why people call bankruptcy is they, they primarily file bankruptcy for two reasons. One is to get the benefit of the stop sign again. It's called the automatic stay of bankruptcy, which is stop everything. We don't want one creditor pecking at the consumer. Fairness. The other is to discharge debt, get rid of it, extinguish it. So when somebody files a liquidation proceeding, Chapter 7, if, it, if an asset is exempt, for instance, uh, life insurance cash value, it's exempt. Pension money sitting in the pension account, exempt. Uh, um, common homestead exemption. Somebody owned a house in New York City, the first $150,000 of equity is exempt from creditors. So that's a, generally speaking what a liquidation proceeding is. The other kind of reorganization is, look, I need my phone to go to work. So instead of me giving you the phone, you selling it for cash, I'll pay you 10 cents a week for 10 weeks, and then you take that money, give it to the creditors, and then I keep the asset. Most people who file in Chapter 13, which is for individuals who are wage earners, are filing because they own a home. Most people who file because they own a home, they've defaulted on the mortgage, there's, there's a foreclosure going on. There's a foreclosure sale coming up in a few weeks. They need the benefit of the stop sign, and they need time to work out a repayment plan to their creditors. Um, that repayment plan can be over a three to five year period. And it's basically rolling up all of the arrears and the credit card debts and the other debts that the person owes and making one payment according to the plan to a trustee. And then the trustee will take that money and distribute it to creditors. That's broadly speaking the two kinds of bankruptcies that there are. Questions about that? Okay. So now, when the person, we'll talk about how a person decides when it's time, but what goes into the, the petition? The person who goes and wants to file bankruptcy has to file it looks like it's about 40 or 50 page document, very long, and you sit there answering all kinds of questions. But the basic form of a petition is you're going to put down assets and income and, and expenses. Oh, sorry, assets and liabilities, income and expenses. So there's one, there are two parts of the petition that deal with assets. One are, are real property, which we're talking about real estate. So if a person owns a house, a condo, a co-op, co-op is sometimes considered personal property, sometimes real property for bank, for this purpose considered real estate, real property. Uh, land that for some reason people forget they have land in other countries, but it counts. They put it all down into one schedule. And then they put down in the other part of the schedule of assets, all other assets in the world other than real estate is called personal property. So if the debtor owns an interest in a trade park, I have the little, uh, I don't know, Fourth Street logo, logo. God forbid I ever file. I own the, my service mark in that. It may be a sellable asset. It may have value to somebody, but i got to put it down anyway. What a lot of people forget, um, when somebody files for bankruptcy, if they're suing somebody else, let's say that they loan somebody money or... Generally, what people forget is that they're suing for a personal injury case or a worker's compensation case. The, the debtor has to put down on the petition not only actual things that he has, but rights that he has, including the right to sue somebody. If the 
And some people are funny. They, they think that if they don't put down the petition, that they have a certain debt uh, asset, that they, if they don't list it, that it, 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 they can keep it later. It's actually the opposite. Besides it being bankruptcy fraud, federal crime, uh, it's also that later on, the, they don't put down the lawsuit they had. They, the, the company that they're suing, the, lawyer, the law firm, is going to find that the person filed bankruptcy and is going to make a motion in the personal injury case to dismiss it, saying, hey, you, were, you filed bankruptcy. You didn't put down the personal injury claim you had in the bankruptcy. Done. And that, that's the law. It's a very harsh uh, result. But it's very important that the debtor put down everything in the petition be truly honest. And uh, we all know, uh, I guess, Teresa from Bill Hoswell, she's out now, but the husband's in for both the bankruptcy fraud. My Dykstra went to jail for bankruptcy fraud. Uh, it's real. It happens. Rob? Yep. So, Assembly Member Pam Harris from Coney Island and Bay Ridge is uh, currently in bankruptcy fraud. It's one of the... Right, right. She, yeah, one of It's true. One of the Okay. okay. So it, it is a real, it's, I, I was once sitting in a meeting of creditors, uh, so I'll talk to you about what this is. After, I'll talk about the rest of the petition, but I was once sitting, uh, after the petition's filed, uh, the debtor has to show up in front of a trustee. They call it a meeting of creditors, but for the most part, creditors are not showing up, but just the, the bankruptcy trustee is signed to the case. They ask questions about the petition. And I had a client sitting there, and she's listening to all the questions that the trustees asking somebody else. Mr. Class, I, I didn't put down something on my petition, and it's, it's something big. So it's very hard. I go, look, if you just walk out of here, then chances are the bankruptcy case will just get dismissed as opposed to you having to go through with it. And that's what we did. All right, that's that. Sometimes that's the value of a lawyer is to be that ear and give some advice because not everybody knows that. Um, make sure that the, the petition is honest, yeah, because otherwise it can be a problem criminally. But also, a bankruptcy proceeding is voluntary, so the right to a discharge is a privilege. So if you want the benefit of the privilege, you have to come clean to the court. Income. A lot of people who file bankruptcy forget when they're putting down income, they forget to put down the two or three tenants that they're collecting cash rent from that they don't put down the petition. They just put down the paycheck. Uh-uh. And then they say, well, if I report the cash that I'm making in the bankruptcy, I don't put it down on my taxes. I say, well, look, I'm only here to give you bankruptcy advice. I'm not the IRS, but I'm telling you, if you file this petition, you have to be honest in the petition. When you do after that, that is your business. I will tell you that judges, in, in, you hear about in matrimonial all the time, but judges have a certain obligation to report if they believe this tax fraud. Um, I know that judges are very, very reluctant to do such a thing, but don't push it. That's basically the advice, is don't push it that way. Put down every petition. Um, expenses. Generally, we're, we're going to go off of an average month's expenses while we're putting down. And a lot of people think it's usually the exact opposite of what you think. Most people think that they spend too little. They don't realize that they, if they spend $500 in the spring for cleaning the windows you know, of the house, you have to then take that $500, divide it by 12, and put in what the monthly cost is of cleaning the windows to that house or their apartment. Uh, whatever it is, a lot of people, they, they kind of underestimate their expenses when truly they spend more. Sometimes you have people that they think they spend a hell of a lot, but they actually don't, and they have the opposite problem. They're leaving too much what's called disposable income on the table. That could push them into having to make a repayment plan. If there's too much disposable income on the table, the trustee says, well, you can afford to pay your credit or something. And the answer is, yes, you can. Um, in 2005, one of the big changes to the to, uh, um, bankruptcy code created something you can all Google this after, called the means test, which uh, uh, one of our other uh, former presidents called the, mean, called the mean test. 
But basically, is you have you put down your income and expenses based on IRS guidelines for the New York State area. There's a median household income amount based on number of people in the household, and then there are different guidelines based on how much rent should cost, transportation, food. So somebody who's spending three thousand dollars a month on rent, which sounds outrageous, except not not in Brooklyn, not in New York. If you go, I have a friend in uh, Texas who rents an entire house for eleven hundred dollars. You can't rent a shoebox here for eleven hundred dollars. Okay, so the problem is that based on the IRS guidelines, that person has disposable income left over that can fund the plan. But the person says, "Hey, I, I don't have it." I may say, I, "It may be that I make ninety thousand dollars, but after that, we're, by the we're hit. All of you know, in New York City." We're going to hit the most entire country, state, federal, city. And now the, the other shoe is going to drop. The next April, not this April, next April, when all these people realize, Roseanne knows, because she's ready, she's going to get ready. She's going to be busy. Next April, when everybody in New York City and, and, and the, down, the downstate counties figure out how the Congress screwed everybody in New York so badly, and I'm just now giving my uh, opinion. But we, we have, they eliminated so much, reduced so much of our deductions mm -hmm. that all the people who bought up for housing uh, and, and make high income are not going to be able to take the same deductions. Can't afford is their house rich, cash poor. It's going to create a huge problem, and nobody's going to realize it now. A lot of people do. But if you start looking it up, get, get worried. Okay, and then it, it's going to turn out that the disposable income test is going to be affected too because that's based on IRS guidelines. So whatever the, the tax is coming out, yes, that, that's all part of the mix, but hopefully somebody who files bankruptcy uh, is able to keep one's house. Not easy. Or able to, file, to actually get a discharge. Now, most, if it makes you feel any better though, most bankruptcy cases that are filed are Chapter 7 liquidation, and most of those cases are what we call a no-asset case. There's, there's nothing left. It's not so comforting, but there's nothing left. Once a person files, there's nothing left to give the trustee, and the trustee closes the case. That means that um, most people, you know, you know I guess my, my view of New York is not the same as some friends who are in you know, banking, finance. Most people who come to me, and most people I see, they, they are living hand to mouth. They don't have any real assets to talk about other than a small pension, maybe some life insurance. Then most people are no asset cases, which it's only comforting in the sense that it's another thing you, you'll see, an expression you'll see, they get the fresh start of bankruptcy, clean slate. Um, they now can, they're, they're once again, their credit score will actually improve. The reason that, and as people find that very counterintuitive, um, once somebody's filed bankruptcy and discharged all their debt, it's like a, it's like a drug dealer. They came out of rehab and they're ready for the drugs again. And the drug dealer is waiting. That's what the credit card companies are. They're saying, okay. That when people file bankruptcy, they say, oh my God, I'm never going to get a credit card again. Are you kidding? You're going to get credit card solicitations two minutes after you file bankruptcy because you're a good risk again. You have no debt owed to anybody. You now can take on new debt. And, and you know, look, I, if somebody is responsible with debt, even after passing through a bankruptcy, we're, we're a credit driven society at this point. Try to rent a car and not have a credit card. Try to reserve a hotel room. Try to walk into Sweet Green and buy something for cash. You can't. And more and more stores and restaurants are going cashless. So um, it's good and bad. People who have uh, issues with, with debt and credit are, are in big trouble. It's, it's uh, you know, they're not able to pay for things with cash. And they see that one of the best ways to handle a credit problem, and what Debtors Anonymous used to, I assume they still recommend it, is pay for things with cash. Because first of all, it, it hurts. When you take out 
$700 to buy sneakers. It hurts. But when you say, oh, I love these sneakers, I really want them, and you pay seven, and sneakers can really cost 700 which I find ridiculous. You, you, you'll, you'll be paying the 700 on a credit card, and you'll deal with it later. That's the society we've created, and it's good and it's bad. Uh, but it's bad if the person can't afford it and can't manage debt. It, it's bad when you get the bill and you don't, you don't have the money to pay the bill. You know, at least if you, if you wake up and say, man, what a night I had, you know? <laughs> You know, but, but you don't get that, you know? So once once the person files the bankruptcy petition, about 30 days later is a meeting of creditors. The person shows up and says, hey, I, I owe all this debt and I don't have anything. And then you talk about your petition and the, the trustee says, okay, case closed. The, the next step is that the person is going to receive a discharge which means you no longer owe all of your unsecured debt. It doesn't get rid of the mortgage. It doesn't get rid of student loans. It doesn't get rid of tax debt. There, there, there are other kinds of debts as well. But with taxes, income, there, there is a way to discharge old tax debt if you filed for income taxes more than three years prior when the bankruptcy case is being filed, there is a way of discharging old tax debt. But sales tax, like let's say that the person uh, owned a business, uh, retail store, it happens a lot, didn't pay the sales tax. Because they, they either didn't file the sales, the sales tax return, they couldn't even have the money to pay it. Um, sales tax is a fiduciary obligation on the part of the government, it doesn't go away. Um, payroll taxes, withholding taxes, the employer can't beat it. Um, there are other categories of debts that are non-dischargeable. Some debts that are non-dischargeable means they're not wiped out. The creditor, had, when the bankruptcy case is filed, the creditor gets a notice. That, hey, Joe Blow filed bankruptcy. The creditor has an obligation to go to court and say either A, the, the debtor lied in the petition, the entire bankruptcy should be dismissed. The, the debtor is not entitled to a discharge because the debtor was not honest. Or B, I don't care about the debtor being discharged, but my debt should not be discharged. I want the court, I want you to determine that my debt is non-dischargeable. There are certain time frames of when